we need to understand the CDO thing because when you have any series of dominoes, you need to understand the first domino first or none of them ever fall. This is really the first domino, CDOs. CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, the thing everybody's talking about. By the way, the thing that brought down Merrill Lynch and everybody that failed in the system owned all these liabilities, so it's important we understand it. Here's the deal. The theory is, if I have a bunch of loans, subprime loans, bank loans, whatever, a bunch of stuff, some of it could be crap, and I put it all together, that there's a diversification benefit from doing so, that I've, I'm covered across a wide range. And therefore, the collection of those assets is better than owning any one. And the rating agencies looked at the performance of those assets, in this, in this example, 500 million loans, and they said, well, the default rate on that type of security these days is less than 1%. So I think, me, the rating agency guy, I'll lend basically 80 cents on the dollar. I'll say that there, I can put 400 million of loans against this pool of stuff. And the only way I lose money is if they default at a 20% rate, more than 20 times where they are today. And not only do they have to default, but I have to get wiped out. So there's really no risk, zero risk in this AAA thing. Okay. And then I'll make the same bet, well, hell, if it's, 50, if it's 500 million of assets, gee, you'd have to have a 10% default rate before, it, you know, you'd have to get uh, further down before it's single A. And so I'll make that bet, too, that, you know, I still have 50 million of equity against 500 million of assets, so there's some part of that that's kind of single A. And people needed yield in a low interest rate environment, and so they were buying these AAA notes at 5% because short-term rates were like 2% just to use a, a crass example. Okay, and so the demand for AAA paper at high rates, and by the way, we all know there's no free lunch. This sure looks like a free lunch. You're getting no risk for extra return. This is why these are interesting to people. If you look at the P&L of a CDO, it's not really all that complicated. 500 million times 7% is 35 million of interest income. And if you pay your liabilities off at 5% and 6%, you got 23 million of expense. All of a sudden, I've got $12 million of income on $50 million of equity. Voila. I have a 24% piece of paper in a, in a market environment where interest rates are 2 3 4%. It's money. And the, and the thing that this is like a crack cocaine in the financial system. Let's look at all the ways banks make money here. They originate mortgages. They then sell them into these things. They underwrite these liabilities into the, into the market for uh, profit. And then they lend, and then they finance those purchases by hedge funds. It's a money machine, and the bank takes zero risk. That's exactly how they got to that other chart where they're not the lender anymore. It's through this mechanism. And everybody, as I mentioned, if you look at Lehman and you look at Merrill, all these guys, they own tons of these AAA notes because they were riskless on their balance sheet. And that's why they let their leverage get up because they figured, oh, it's AAA, I can't get hurt. Well, they were wrong. Okay, every cycle, Every economic cycle, whether it's tulips or penny stocks or commodities or tech stocks, has, an, has a bubble of some kind. And in, in this cycle, it's housing prices. And it's really, it, it's interesting to note that even though we all have this kind of conventional wisdom that houses prices go up all the time, really from 1975 to 2000, they only went up about 1.4% a year. Not all that sexy, even though I think if I, if I took a poll before this went up, I think you'd probably all say 3 to 5%. Right around 2000, housing prices started to go up like crazy. Why? For a couple of reasons. People like to blame Greenspan for this. But it was government mandate that Freddie and Fannie, two of the players we'll talk about later, had to, in 2000, give loans 50% of their giant portfolios to people who had below median incomes in the United States. It was government subsidy of housing. It was selling the government guarantee down to create a program to get home ownership up. And in fact, what they did here is they actually moved the homeownership rate in the United States from 64% to 69%. Some of those people should be in houses. Some of them should be in smaller ones, and some of them shouldn't be in any house. Nonetheless, that's what happened. So that thing started to go. Fannie and Freddie started to finance all the weak guys in the system. Then we had 9-11, we had some other stuff, and Greenspan had to keep rates down for a really long time. Is it his fault? I don't really think so, but uh, let people like to blame him. So the ball gets rolling. Greenspan keeps the rates low because of other things. Housing prices keep going up. And there's no default anywhere in mortgage land. Because if you can't make your payment, you refinance. Or you sell your house and refinance because prices are going like this. This thing went crazy. And there's a guy by the name of uh, John Paulson. He's no, related, no relation to Hank. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. He's a hedge fund manager. 
He made $15 billion on the housing crisis with one chart, which is this. If you understand this, everything kind of makes some sense. And this is the thing, by the way, that the rating agencies missed, and I'll come back to. He figured, this guy Paulson, figured out that the default rate on loans is related to the price appreciation of homes. Not really all that. If you think about it, if you're an asset lender, what are you lending against? If it goes down, you're going to get hurt. If it goes up, you're going to do well. The rating agencies did not have this in their calculus. They were not looking at price changes. There was no subprime market before 2001. They had a very small sample set on which they were basing all of their assumptions. And the sample set was all good. So the, the stuff they were putting in their model was unbelievably biased, and they didn't pick it up. But Paulson did. And he figured out, if I get a 10%, see that along the bottom, the home appreciation, if I get a 10% decline in housing prices, the default rate of the securities we just talked about goes to 27. And if you remember, I just told you a minute ago that the default rate for AAAs, where they started to get hurt, was 20. Well, prices go down 10%. Prices are currently down about 18% system-wide. So all Paulson did is figured out that once these things go down, people are going to default on mortgages. Those, those, those triple A's and single A's are not going to be worth what they're worth. They're going to crash. And he found a way to get short that instrument, and he made $15 billion on this very simple thing. But all he did was he looked at that above trend housing price thing and made a bet it would revert to the trend line and just you know, put everything he had on the bet. This is a really big issue because it's that housing price bubble that's caused everything. OK. So that's the CDO context, and that's why we had defaults. Now we, have to, now we just take one more step back before we get into the players of what's the stuff that went in the CDO. Let's, you have to understand subprime at its core to understand what went wrong in the CDO world. And when we talk about subprime, uh, there's, three kinds, there's, there, there's three kinds of mortgages conforming, which you won't talk much about. Alt-A, which is uh, the first loan senior stuff, although it has some uh, nicks against it, like loan to value or docs or something, and then subprime, which is generally an alt-A with a bad credit score, OK? And the market size is about a billion of subprime, is about a billion to a billion five, which is only about 10 to 15% of mortgages, only 3% of the United States debt market. This is why Ben Bernanke said in June of 2007 that the subprime thing is contained. It's over here. It's, everything's going to be fine. It's not really an issue, because it's just not that big. It's just not that big. So we have to talk about why it got big. Uh, and you'll see now they're estimating losses about 500 billion, which will be about three and a half, four percent of GDP in that bottom left of that slide. To put it in, in context, you, the uh, SNL crisis was a little bit below that, and the Japanese banking crisis a little bit above that. So it's kind of a relatively standard crisis in the world of crises, even though to us it's wild. Remember that chart where the housing prices were going up? Well, in 2005, uh, or you remember that? Uh, uh, that cycle thing I did at the very beginning where people kind of pile on. In 2005, we had an unbelievable amount of transactions, people buying homes they shouldn't have bought. We had 48% more transactions in the housing market than trend. Everybody got in the pool, and it got crazy. So actually, when you bring more buyers, housing prices keep going up. And then when you have more buyers, people get stupid to attract those buyers. And in 2006, we had this terms peak where it just got ultimately stupid, where all discipline was thrown out the window. 33% 100% of the deals, 100% loan to value. People doing stuff with 100% loan to value and no docs. People doing everything on appraisals, guess what, guess what happens when appraisals matter? People lie about appraisals. You have appraisal fraud going crazy. So these two classes in the system, it's like the, the apple of the, going through the python or pumpkin through the python. The two classes of 05 and 06 of mortgages that are going to have to work its way through the CDO system are death. It's the cancer in the system. It's going through and it's taking everybody with it. 